الحمد لله خالق الوجود من العدم وجاعل النور من الظلم ومخرج الصبر من الألم فملق التوبة على الندم فنشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم ونصلي على رسوله الأكرم ذي الشرف الأشم والنور الأتم والكتاب المحكم وكمال النبيين والخاتم سيد ولد آدم الذي بشر به عيسى بن مريم ودعا لبعثته إبراهيم عليه السلام حين كان يرفع قواعد بيت الله المحرم فصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى أتباعه خير الأمم الذين بارك الله بهم كافة الناس العرب منهم والعجم فالحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إنما المؤمنون الذين آمنوا بالله ورسوله وإذا كانوا معه على أمر جامع لم يذهبوا حتى يستأذنوه إن الذين يستأذنونك أولئك الذين يؤمنون بالله ورسوله فإذا استأذنوك لبعض شأنهم فأذن لمن شئت منهم واستغفر لهم الله إن الله غفور رحيم رب الشح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أمن يا رب العالمين uh, in today's khutbah, inshallah, I would like to do a short comparison between two ayat of the Qur'an, one belonging to Surah An-Nur and the other belonging to Surah At-Tawbah. These are all, both surahs that were revealed to the Prophet wasallam when he was in Medina. And just a little bit of background will help us understand this comparison and some lessons we can take with us for our lives. Uh, the first thing I think I'd like to, to remind myself of all of you of is the Prophet wasallam was playing many different roles when he was in Medina. So he's of course the Messenger of Allah wasallam. that's his primary role. But additionally, he's also now the counselor for an entire community. He's also their advisor. People that have a family issue or a dispute among themselves in Medina, they all come running to the Prophet wasallam. When there's, a, when there's a judgment issue, there's a financial dispute of some kind, there's a loan that has not been paid off or something like that, they're also coming to the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he's essentially become the governor of Medina. But at the same time, he Alayhi Salatu Wasallam is also serving as the general, the commanding general of the Muslim military. And that's also a very different role. The military role is very different from a civilian role. So he's of course a husband alayhi salatu wasalam. He's, he's a, a father, he's a friend, he's also a community leader, he's also a judge, he's also a counselor, he's also the religious leader, the, the prophet of Allah. He's also alayhi salatu wasalam, all of these roles and he's also the commanding military general of the Muslim military. So he's playing, he's wearing many hats at the same time. And he has to perform all of those roles at the same time. And then on top of all of that, there are complications because Medina is a complicated place. Mecca was simple, Mu'min and Kafir. There's two groups, that's it, it's that simple. When you get to Medina, you've got people that are believing in him, that have come along with him, the Muhajirun. There are people that, الَّذِينَ تَبَوَّعُوا الدَّارَ iman, The ones who opened up their homes and their faith and welcome the, the, the comers, the, the, the migrants, the Ansar. And then there are those who see this as a problem. Like who, who is this foreigner coming to our city and now he's the governor of our city. I mean, if we were going to have leadership, it should be local leadership. We don't want some foreigner running us. And you know, the Arabs back in the day, they're very tribal people. So if they want leadership, they want a leader from inside their own tribe. It should be from Aus or Khazraj or something. Why is he coming from the outside and he gets to be the leader? And on top of that, not only is he the leader, the closest people to him are the Muhajirun. They're also from Mecca, they're not from Medina because the Ansar are new Muslims. 
and the closest to the Prophet وسلم, are the ones that have done the most sacrifice, right? So the, and those are the people from Mecca. So they see this as a, as a political problem. How can we just, okay, fine, he's the Prophet, I get it. But why should we just accept his leadership like that? It, it should, we should have some say too. We are, we're important too. This is our city after all. We're the ones that are sponsoring them. We're the ones that are financially supporting them. We're doing all the sacrifices, etc., etc. So there were some people who, even though they accepted Islam, they had some of these sentiments inside them. They had these feelings inside them that this is, after all, our city. I don't know, we're spending all the money. And when we go to war, most of the people that die on the battlefield are our people because we're, we're providing the majority of the manpower. Right? It's all expense. Where's the benefit? What are we getting? We're just, and as soon as he came, all these other tribes are starting to become our enemy too. And Mecca, the biggest influencer in the region, they've become our enemy. They're coming after us now. So this is bad for our politics. It's bad for our economics. It's bad for us socially. This, this, is a, this is a stir. So, and Medina is not just one group of people, right? There are Jewish tribes also. There are the large tribes of Aus and Khazraj, and between them, some of them have become Muslim for sincere reasons. Others have become Muslim because, well, you know, I guess he's the governor. Okay, fine, I'll join Islam too. But they don't have a, a really long, a strong commitment to the Prophet ﷺ. And in private conversations, they're not that serious. They're not taking him that seriously. Also, what we, what we have to know is that the way we think about government now, Right, and when, when somebody joins the military, they put a uniform on, right? And if, they, if their commanding officer gives them a command, they cannot disobey that command. It's, it's actually insubordination. And they can be court-martialed for insubordination. They have to report for duty. And that's true of any military in the world, right? But the, the Prophet ﷺ, when he comes to Medina and he becomes the leader, but he's still, it's not an official government. It's not the way we think about governments now. Even though I'm calling him the governor of Medina alayhi salatu wasalam, it's not exactly like this. It's actually a voluntary military. All, this, all the companions, the ones who came with him and the ones who accepted Islam in Medina, the Ansar, all of them are essentially volunteers. None of them are on payroll. None of them are being supported financially. None of them have to report for, for duty or anything like that, right? And so what happens even, for example, in the Battle of Badr, the first major battle that everybody here knows about, was actually there was a, a call for volunteers to join the military. And then what happens in Uhud is even more strange. At the Battle of Uhud, a th about a third of the army planned on joining them and then right at the right moment, turning their back. So it would demoralize the military right before they go into battle. So they were already down one to three so there was about three times the size of the Muslim forces that were coming from the other side. But now when a third of them left, about 700 left now, then they're one to four, right? And all of your strategy, where are you going to situate your soldiers? How are you going to manage the situation? How are you going to choke? What are the choke points against the enemy? All of that had to be redesigned because the munafiqun left at the right moment. They could have just not come along to begin with. It would have been easier, but they waited until the last minute. So. This, and, and, and I'm telling you all of this because if you walk away from the battlefield today, if there's a soldier in any military in the world, and there's a battle, they're going for war, and in the middle of the positioning of the soldiers, two, three hundred of them walk back. What is going to happen to those soldiers? They are going to be court-martialed, they, they, they may even be charged with treason, that even may be punishable by death. All of that is standard military procedure. That can be considered espionage. You try to, to hurt the military from within. Their loyalties can be questioned, isn't it? But after Uhud and the losses the Muslims suffered at Uhud, when the next time the Prophet ﷺ is standing on the mimbar and giving a khutbah, you have to understand that after Uhud, because the Prophet ﷺ was almost killed in Uhud, and he suffered several injuries actually to his face, in fact, even a, a, an arrow uh, uh, reportedly pierced through his jaw. So this is not a recovery. This is not an injury you recover from immediately. A couple of his teeth have been lost. He had to be pl plastered on his face. So the next time he's standing in front of the Muslims, giving a khutbah alayhi salatu wasalam, you can see the injuries on his face. And there are people sitting in the, the masjid among those who walked away from the battlefield. They're sitting there among the others, and there are those who left their position in the, among the archers, they're also sitting there. 
And the ayat are coming and talk in Ali Imran, for example, in Surah An-Nisa, for example, the ayat are coming and talking about the hypocrites, and it's talking about those who left their position and those who showed weakness, etc. Different categories of people, but nobody's being punished. Nobody's actually being taken. You're going to get detained. You're going to get court-martialed. You're going to get, you know, executed. None of that is happening. Why? Because it's not the same structure of the military that we think of as the military structure today. The reason I wanted to give you all of this introduction is for you and I to understand something about the nature of what was happening in Medina. In Medina, the Prophet ﷺ commanded the Sahaba with the rule of Sami'na wa Ata'na, we hear and we obey. He was commanding them, but they were all volunteering. They were absolutely loyal to the Prophet ﷺ because they believed him to be the Prophet of Allah. But it's not like if they didn't get up and go with him that somebody could tell them, hey, why aren't you coming? There's no government, there's no, there's no enforcement of any kind. It's not all that different from you choosing to come here to pray Salatul Jumu'ah. You made a choice to come here and nobody can stop you from not coming. If you stayed home or you stayed at work and you never came, that's a decision you made. You made the decision to obey Allah and His Messenger by coming here and praying your Salah, right? So now, having said all of that, now the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is asking the companions sometimes after in Medina because there are different situations and sometimes there are some tribes that are trying to attack. Sometimes the Meccans are making some moves and making some secret negotiations and the Prophet Sallallahu has to t send small groups of companions to go figure out, find out what they're doing. Go scout, go on a scouting mission. Take a small regiment of soldiers and go do this or do, do that task. So he's assigning people to go on these small missions, not just battles, on these small missions. But these people, they have a family, they have homes, they have, you know, they have other obligations. They're not just sitting there waiting for the Prophet ﷺ to instruct them. They have other obligations. Somebody has a sick old mother, somebody has children, somebody has to take care of the farm, right? And now he's being told, go out and go figure out what's going on in that position or that position, right? Think about those people and then understand the ayah I'm about to share with you. This is again in Surah An-Nur. Allah says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ True believers are only are those that actually believe in Allah and His Messenger sincerely. وَإِذَا كَانُوا مَعَهُ عَلَىٰ أَمْرٍ جَامِعٍ And if they are with him on any joint expedition, if they join him on any collective task, together they've been given an assignment. لَمْ يَذْهَبُوا حَتَّى يَسْتَأْذِنُوهُ They wouldn't walk away from it, they wouldn't leave until they sought his permission. They wouldn't leave until they sought his permission. So there's a volunteer, you know, if you're, if you're at work and you want to leave work early, you got to ask your boss. Because it's going to affect your, your job security. You understand? If you're, if you're in, the, in school and you want to be released early, you better get a permission from the principal's office or whatever, right? A, a soldier has to get official permission to get off duty. But the Sahaba, they don't actually have to ask permission because they are what? They're, vo they're volunteers. But even though they are volunteers, they recognize the seriousness of this discipline that they signed up for. So they never leave without asking for permission. And Allah, Allah, them, Allah says in this ayah that this is a sign of how seriously they take their iman. That even though there's no authority over them, physical authority over them, their iman tells them, I'm not going to leave until I ask permission. And then Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَأْذِنُونَكَ أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Those, no doubt, that are asking for your permission, those are the people who believe in Allah and His Messenger. The fact that they're asking your permission is actually a sign of how seriously they take this. This is not some extracurricular activity for them. There's not just some extra good that they're doing. They take it very seriously and they wouldn't budge from their place until they asked your permission. فَإِذَا اسْتَأْذَنُوكَ لِبَعْضِ شَأْنِهِمْ All of this is one ayah. فَإِذَا اسْتَأْذَنُوكَ لِبَعْضِ شَأْنِهِمْ And if they were to ask your permission, when they do come and ask your permission, for some personal situation they have to deal with, then فَأْذَنْ لِمَنْ شِئْتَ مِنْهُمْ Then give permission to whoever you want among them. So the Prophet ﷺ is being told, you still have the final decision, you're the commander-in-chief, you're the in charge, you can give some, uh, some permission, some you can say, no, I really need you. So I'm, you can hold them back. وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمُ اللَّهِ And ask Allah for their forgiveness. 
Now, why, why would Allah add, ask Allah for their forgiveness? Because the one who came and asked for permission, permission Ya Rasulullah, you asked us to go on this expedition, but my mother is sick right now. Can I go take care of her instead? Is that, is that, would that be okay? And the Prophet says, that's fine. You can stay with your mom. But he still feels guilty. He feels guilty that I didn't go on the mission with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So Allah gives him an extra gift. Not only does he say this person has real iman, but then to get rid of that guilt, he says, no, I'll give you an extra gift. The messenger himself sallallahu alayhi wa will make istighfar for you. The messenger himself will pray for you. So he feels a comfort inside of his heart that even Rasulullah is making dua for me. And then Allah says, Inna Allah ghafoorur rahim. Certainly Allah is extremely forgiving, always loving and caring. So this is also kind of a wa'd al maghfirah at the end because of the inna. It says if Allah is promising people like that, Allah will forgive. So this was a brief summary of the, the, the 62nd ayah of Surah An-Nur. But now let's go to another place in the Quran, Surah At-Tawbah, where we seem to be getting Almost the opposite message. So listen carefully. لا يستأذنك الذين يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر أن يجاهدوا بأموالهم وأنفسهم والله عليم بالمتقين. Those who believe in Allah in the last day will never ask your permission when they're told to go struggle if they are to go struggle in in the path of Allah with their money and their selves. They would never ask their permit. So in the other ayah we just read, the fact that they ask permission is a sign of their iman. Now we're reading in Surah At-Tawbah, anybody who really has faith, that they were asked to go make jihad in Allah's path in, with their money and themselves, they would never ask permission anyway. Seems like an opposite message. Now listen again. He says, إِنَّمَا يَسْتَأْذِنُكَ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ by the way, the only people asking you permission are the ones who don't believe in Allah and don't believe in the last day. وَرْتَابَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ And their hearts are filled with doubt. فَهُمْ فِي رَيْبِهِمْ يَتَرَدَّدُونَ And they are in their doubt, they keep going back and forth. Opposite message. I just spent 15 minutes explaining to you the fact that they ask permission is a sign that they have faith. And now in Surah At-Tawbah, the fact that they ask permission is a sign that they have no faith. Now, how can that be? How, how does that make any sense? So this is, this is the, the reconciliation, the two very different situations that I want to explain to you. But before I explain them to you, I'm going to give you an analogy to make this a little bit better. Many of you are in business. Maybe you run a store, maybe you run a, you manage a restaurant, or you have some kind of a business where you need your employees in certain seasons more than other seasons. There's low season and there's high season, right? So for example, for, you know, if somebody's working in the mall or something during like, Thanksgiving holidays or New Year sales and all that stuff, they need their employees on full deck. I remember in, in, when I was in high school, I used to work at a clothing store and you, things used to be easy until December. And in December, you got to get to the store. And even though it opens at 10 a.m., you got to get there at 6 a.m. You got to unpack all the new boxes, put all the clothes up, all this other stuff. And the store will stay open extra late hours. And then you got to stay extra late hours to clean up for the next day. And it's like almost like a 24 hour shift. When, it, when, it, when it's sales season, right? And so sometimes there's an emergency situation where you really need your best employees. You need them. And even if they have a good excuse, like at that time, for example, if I was the, if I was the best employee for my manager, right? And I said, hey, tomorrow I know it's like the big sales day. It's Black Friday, right? Uh, but uh, I need to take a day off. I'm, I'm having a little anxiety. I'm a little triggered by Black Friday, so I'm just gonna take a day off. What's my, what's my manager gonna say, listen? And, and by the way, if another employee comes who's actually not very good, he's lazy anyway, and he says, hey, can I have tomorrow off? The boss will say, why don't you take the whole week off? You can go. Because who's the, who's the boss gonna give permission to? The, the lousy employee, because he's a, he's a liability anyway. You understand? And the best employee is gonna say, listen, I, I need you. I'm sorry. I know you have your situation, but I need you because I can't give you time off right now. You understand? Because, and by the way, the, the, the good employee is going to start feeling like, wow, that guy doesn't do any work and he gets a week off. And I do all the work and I don't even get a day off. But the reality of it is he's not getting a day off because he's more valued. You understand? So now with that background in mind, what happened in Surah At-Tawbah? In Surah At-Tawbah, the Muslims were about to face a challenge they've never faced before. First of all, Surah At-Tawbah came after Makkah was conquered. 
Not before Makkah was conquered, after Makkah was conquered. Now that Makkah has been conquered, actually the Muslims are an official government. Up until the conquest of Makkah, I explained to you what that looked like. But now this is an official government that is going to issue orders and punishments also. And now that they've conquered Makkah and the letters have been sent to the Roman and Persian empires, the Romans have been offended by the letters sent by the Prophet ﷺ, and they're amassing a military force of about 100,000 reportedly that's coming for the Muslims. They're coming for them, they're coming for us and they wanna annihilate Islam, the Roman Empire. I mean, there's one thing to go after Quraysh, which is a tribe in Arabia. This is a different ball game. You're going after the mightiest empire on the planet. You understand? Or instead of you going after them, they're coming after you. Now, this is what you call the time of a draft. This was an emergency. No longer were the Muslims being asked to volunteer. Every believer was told, if you're capable of, of, and of age, you're joining the military. This is a state of emergency. By the way, in the United States, uh, you know, in our, in our constitutional framework, we also have the provision for the draft, don't we? If there need be, and if the time comes, and there's, there's need for overwhelming force to repel against an enemy, the young men can be drafted. You know, they can be drafted into the military. So this was actually a draft that was called for in Surah At-Tawbah. No longer was there room for not responding, not dealing with. In fact, you know, the, the Munafiqun did so much messed up stuff before the hypocrites and no consequences. But after Surah At-Tawbah, they have to answer for what they do. They better come and ask for permission. But everybody knew this is the biggest emergency in the history of of the seerah, like this is the greatest emergency. And here Allah said, people who even bother to ask you for permission, these are the kinds of people that never believed in this cause anyway. Because they, if they understood the serious, and everybody understands the seriousness of the, of the moment, in this moment, asking permission is proof that you have no faith in this moment. So under more normal circumstances, if you need to go, at least you should ask for permission. That shows that you take the discipline seriously. But now, what there's in, now that there's a hyper emergency, and everybody's supposed, actually, you can't even leave without asking for permission. In fact, even the hypocrites were coming and asking for permission in Surah Al-Dawla. Even they were coming and asking for permission. And something like what I described to you already happened. A hypocrite, a hypocrite came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, yes, we're going towards, you know, to battle the Romans. But, you know, I, there's too many beautiful women on the way. It's just going to be hard for me. You know, I'll get distracted. So it's better for my faith if I just stay, stay you know, in Medina. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, easier for me. You know, it's, 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 so I won't be in fitna. This, this is what he said. Give me permission, don't put me in fitna. It's in the Quran. And Allah says, Ala fil fitnati sakatu. Or aren't they already in fitna? Aren't they already falling in fitna? What, what, and that kind of a person who's going to make that kind of a lame excuse, I can pretty much guarantee you he's not going to be an asset on the battlefield. That's, that's going to be the first person who turns his back and runs. That's going to be the first person who loses the, the most important position on the battlefield. Right? So what does the Prophet do? والسلام, he gives him permission. He says, oh, you know what? You can stay. And any intelligent general would have made the same decision. Why would I get this loser and get him to join the battlefield? This is going to create a problem. In fact, on the way, he's probably going to talk to other soldiers. What are we doing here, man? We just, I don't even know why I got signed up. And he's going to destroy the morale of other soldiers. He's going to create a bigger problem. You know? So, وَلَا أُضَعُوا خِلَالَكُمْ You know? So, so Allah says, لو كانوا فيكم, you know, زادوكم خبالة, if they would have created more problems for you, they would have run their horses up and down, hey man, you really want to go? You really want to do this? That's what they would have done. So they, they got held back. But what am I, why am I telling you this? Because in fact, now it was mandatory. If you do, if, you, if you're not going to go, you better go ask for permission. This is completely different than what happened before. So now when it's mandatory to ask for permission, the people who wanted to squeak away and kind of escape from their responsibilities or what, is, what Islam wanted from them, those were the people that were called out. People that are coming and asking your permission, they don't have any belief in this cause anyway. They don't believe that anyway. I'll compare this to what happened in, for example, Badr, or even what happened in Uhud. When the Prophet ﷺ asked, the, because the Ansar were the majority force, 
So if we're going to go into battle, we can't go without the Medinans. And it's not the Medinans' war, technically, it's the Meccans' war. It's not our war. So when the Prophet ﷺ asked, he wanted to see, the, the Muhajirun got right up and said, we're, we're with you. But the Prophet ﷺ was waiting for the, for the Ansar to speak up. Like, are they going to show that they're ready, right? And they, they, they spoke up and they, they showed that they're ready. So what do, what do we learn from this comparison? First thing we learn is the Qur'an so beautifully, it doesn't pass the same judgment on the same exact action. In both situations, somebody sought permission. In Surah An-Nur, somebody sought permission. In Surah At-Tawbah, somebody sought permission. But when somebody sought permission in Surah An-Nur, it was a sign that they have faith. And in Surah At-Tawbah, when somebody sought permission, it was a sign that they have no faith. And so it teaches us something about the wisdom of the Qur'an. Allah is not just judging our actions. Allah is judging our actions based on the situation, based on the environment, based on your sincerity, based on your courage. You can't just say, well, it's not haram asking permission. I asked permission, what's the big deal? Uh, the, the deed is not giving you a black and white. It's not giving you a black and white. This, this applies even inside of our own families. There's times where your, your dad needs you, your mother needs you, your spouse needs you. They absolutely, it's an emergency, they need you. You know, there's a, there's a death in the family and everybody's being called. Yeah, I don't want to deal with my cousins. I just, you know, it bothers me right now. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to not show up. Uh, this is the time for you to show up. I don't, nobody cares about your discomfort. This is the time. It's a death in the family. It's an emergency, you know. So there are times where the same exact thing is excusable, even commendable. It's a good thing. And other times the same exact thing is questioned by Allah and actually a sign of hypocrisy. This is a, a demand in the Qur'an that every believer actually exercise wisdom. We have to exercise wisdom in every decision that we make. Are we, are we taking the responsible road? Are we doing what Allah actually would want us to do in this situation? Are we hiding behind a simple fatwa? Because like people like to hide behind fatwa. Well, it's not haram to seek permission. It's not haram to do this. You get any situation, you get yourself a fatwa, and it doesn't matter what the situation is, you want to get the same exact answer. And this is, the, this is a disease that the ummah has fallen into as we got away, further and further away from the Qur'an. You know, hikmah, wisdom, has many facets. One of, the, one of the dimensions of wisdom is that you can see the difference between different situations. You can see the difference between different situations. When a judge is a judge, and let's say, let's say he's a divorce judge, right? He sees one case, and he sees another case, then 10 years later he's seen a thousand cases. But every case, if he's a wise judge, or she's a wise judge, what do they have to do? They have to look at every case as unique. They cannot say, oh, here we go again. I've seen this before. No, you haven't. You can't judge this from a previous case, because this is a unique individual, they have their own story, they have their own background, you cannot come with your presumptions. That's a wise judge, because they're giving every case a unique opportunity. They're not presupposing. Now, look at what happens with us. We, you have a question about some. If someone does this, and if they do that, in general, uh, brother, is it, is it haram sometimes to disobey your husband? Or is it haram sometimes to disobey your mother? It, you know, ask the question in the most general way possible, in the most generic way possible, and somebody will say, yeah, yeah good. in some situations it may be halal. Okay, that's it. Now I'm gonna use this and use this in the most unwise possible way. <laughs> Because somebody told me it's okay. They don't know anything about my situation. They don't know anything about what I did, or what the other person's doing, or what the full so story is, but I'm going to misuse it any way I want. This is what we've become. Just seek a fatwa from somewhere with general language. What do you say about someone who does this, 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 this? And then you just want an answer. Can you, can you give me an answer? And when people come and ask me questions like that, I say, I don't have an answer for you. Why not? I thought you studied Islam. I was like, exactly why? That's exactly why I don't have an answer. Because I studied Islam. Because that's not how Islam works. You can't just give generalizations. I don't know anything about your specific situation. Then they're like, I'm willing to tell you the whole story. Well, that's your version of the story. Then there's another person and they've got their entire story. What would a judge do? A judge would actually look at the entire case from every perspective before they say, this is the Islamic answer. This is the answer, right? But what do we want? We want to give somebody our version of the story and say, no, 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 I'm telling the truth. I got you. You're telling the truth, but you also have feelings. You also have your own perspective, you know? 
And this is, this, is the, this is the kind of wisdom that we're missing. This is the kind of wisdom that the Qur'an highlights in situations like these. The same exact act can be a good thing, and the same exact act can be a bad thing, depending on the context. And if you don't understand the context, you would think the Qur'an is saying two opposite things. SubhanAllah. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us a people of wisdom, and people that seek wisdom from Allah's book and the sunnah of His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And may Allah make us from those who don't make quick judgments for ourselves and for others without understanding the requirements of wisdom. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim, wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعد والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا مقوتا الله Allah <laughs> Allah الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا تتنزل عليهم الملائكة ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا وأبشروا وأبشروا بالجنة التي كنتم توعدون نحن أولياؤكم في الحياة الدنيا نحن أولياؤكم في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة ولكم فيها ما تشتهي أنفسكم ولكم فيها ما تدعون نزلا من غفور رحيم الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين 
اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله استغفر الله استغفر الله استغفر الله استغفر الله الذي لا اله الا الله الحمد لله الحمد لله اللهم صل وسلم